New South Wales is possibly the most well-known state in Australia, being home to the largest city, Sydney. In the 80s and 90s, hitchhiking around Australia was an extremely popular way of traveling around the country. It still happens today, but people are more safety conscious, and it makes it less common. It's also been made illegal in some states, which makes it harder to use as a travel method. New South Wales is on the east side of Australia and has the Tasman Sea to the east and the state of South Australia to the west. The Australian Capital Territory is also inside the state of New South Wales, which is home to the company's capital city of Canberra. Ivan Malott grew up a violent and angry man who had an insatiable need for control. When he lost control in his personal life, he went into the forest and took it from strangers. This is Monsters. Ivan Milot was born on December 27, 1944 in Bosley Park, a suburb of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. His father was a Croatian immigrant laborer who moved to Australia when he was 24 years old to work in the mines. He eventually moved closer to Sydney and began working on the wharf. A few years later, he married an Australian woman named Margaret Piddleston when she was 16 years old. The couple went on to have 14 children, 4 girls and 10 boys, of which Ivan was the fifth child. The family would find a permanent home in the suburb of Guilford where the Malat boys became well known as the neighborhood troublemakers. Ivan was arrested multiple times in his late teens for theft and breaking and entering. He received probation first, then he was put in a juvenile center. After turning 18, he was arrested again for theft and breaking and entering and served 18 months in prison. He was only out about a month before being arrested for auto theft and served another two years. Once out, he was arrested again for theft and sentenced to three more years in prison. In April of 1971, Ivan waited outside the train station in Liverpool and offered a ride to two 18-year-old girls that had gotten off the train. Once they were in the car, he pulled out a knife and threatened to stab them if they called for help. Then he drove out into the woods and tied them both up. He told them that he would kill them if one of them didn't have sex with him, so one of them gave in and agreed. Now, I'm going to stop right here and let you know that I'm using the word agreed with air quotes around it only because it's important later. Ivan had a knife and was threatening to kill them, so there was absolutely no consent. Once they were done and back on the road, the women were able to convince Ivan to stop at a gas station so they could get some drinks, and he agreed. Once the girls were out of the car, they ran into the gas station and told the people inside that they had been kidnapped and raped. A few men ran out to confront Ivan, but he was able to drive away before they got to him. The girls gave a description to the police. In August of 1971, Ivan, his younger brother Michael, and two other men robbed a bank in Canley Heights. They had sawed off 22 caliber rifles and a sawed off shotgun. They got away with $360, but Michael was eventually picked up and interviewed about the robbery. He confessed and ratted out his brother and the two other men. Ivan was arrested and his mother paid the $1,000 bail to get him out. While out on bail, authorities charged Ivan with the kidnap and rape of the girls from the train station. Not wanting to go back to prison, he fled the area, causing his mother to lose the bail money. Ivan got a fake ID and spent most of the next two and a half years in Auckland, New Zealand. Some say that he returned to Australia because he was in trouble with the New Zealand police. Others say he returned because his mother was sick. But either way, once he was back in April of 1974, he was arrested for the robbery and the kidnap and rape charges. This time, he was denied bail. During the rape trial, he explained that the young woman had quote-unquote agreed to have sex with him and the defense attorney started hassling her about her sexual orientation, which tainted the jury enough that he was acquitted. Then he was also acquitted of the robbery charges for some reason. In 1975, at 31 years old, Ivan met 17-year-old Karen Duck, who was secretly pregnant with his cousin's child at the time. 
She would later claim that about a week after they got together, they were driving down the road when Ivan suddenly stopped, grabbed her by the throat, and forced her to have sex with him. Despite this, Karen stayed with Ivan and after giving birth to her son, Jason, she moved into a trailer with Ivan on his parents' property. They lived there for years before Ivan was able to get a loan to purchase a house in Blackett, about 30 minutes further away from Sydney. According to Karen, Ivan became increasingly more abusive after they moved into the house. He became controlling and obsessed with the house being spotless. She said he once got mad at her and smashed a coffee table, then told her if she cleaned up the pieces, he'd destroy the entire house. The pieces of the coffee table sat in the living room for a week as a reminder to her to not question him. She told him that she wanted to have another child, and he told her that he'd shoot her if he ever found out she was pregnant. In 1983, after eight years of abuse, Ivan and Karen got married. A few months after their marriage, Ivan's father died. Not long after, Karen went to live with her mother, but after many calls and letters from her husband, she went back to live with Ivan. The length of their marriage was shorter than the time they dated, but it was equally filled with violence. Ivan accused Karen of having an affair, yelled at her if she talked to the neighbors, threw things at her, and even threatened her while putting a gun to her head. Finally, on Valentine's Day of 1987, Karen had enough and she and Jason left for good. Ivan demanded that her mother tell him where Karen was staying, but the woman refused, even when Ivan threatened to burn down her house if she didn't tell him. A year after Karen left Ivan, her mother's house was set on fire. The fire destroyed two cars and the garage on the house. By the end of 1989, the divorce was final and Ivan was full of anger over Karen's defiance. He even took a job using one of his brother's names to avoid paying alimony. He moved back to his parents' house and worked various jobs on the road. For a while, he worked as a truck driver, which gave him the opportunity to travel and meet young hitchhikers who were looking for a ride. He would use these people as surrogates upon which to release his anger. On December 29, 1989, James Gibson and Deborah Everest, both 19 years old, left Melbourne and hitchhiked in the 900 kilometers or 550 miles to Sydney. There they visited with a friend of James's before they left and started hitchhiking back to Melbourne with the plan of stopping in Walwa to attend a conservation festival. The two teenagers never made it to the festival. On December 31st, a man named Michael James was cycling in the Sydney area when he found a Rico camera. Not seeing anyone else around, he picked it up and brought it home. On March 13, 1990, Wendy Delsberger was driving to Galston near Sydney when she saw a red backpack on the side of the road. She pulled over and put it in her car and brought it home. When she opened the backpack, inside was the name Gibson, an address, and a phone number. When she called the number, James Gibson's mother answered and explained that the backpack was her son's, who she had reported missing on January 15th. The following day, Wendy brought the backpack to the police station and told them exactly where she found it. Two weeks later, a local newspaper ran a story about the missing hikers, the backpack, and the story mentioned that James would have had a Rico camera with him. After reading the story, Michael took the camera that he had found to the police station and it was confirmed to belong to James Gibson. Authorities searched the areas where the backpack and camera were found, but no other signs of James or Deborah were found. Simone Schmiedel loved to travel. She started as soon as she turned 18 by taking a trip from her home in Regensburg, Germany, to Yugoslavia. Two years later, she traveled to Canada and Alaska. At 22 years old, she took her third trip and arrived in Australia on October 1, 1990. She and a friend visited Sydney before hitchhiking to Melbourne and then making their way north to Queensland. They made a few more trips back and forth between Sydney and Melbourne before heading to New Zealand on November 20th. They spent two months in New Zealand before they returned to Sydney on January 19, 1991. The following morning, Simone left her friend and planned to hitchhike back to Melbourne where she was supposed to meet up with her mother, Irwina, who was flying in from Germany a few days later. When Irwina couldn't find her daughter, she reported her missing to the police. Gabor Neugebauer was a 22-year-old from Heimersheim, Germany. In 1991, Gabor and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Anya Habscheid, took an extended holiday. They first traveled to Europe before returning to Germany. 
Later that year, they traveled to Indonesia, staying for a few weeks and then flying to Darwin in North Australia. They traveled to the northern coast of Queensland before making their way south to Sydney. They stayed in a hostel in Sydney for a few days over the Christmas holiday and left on December 26th, headed for Adelaide in South Australia, but they never made it there. From Adelaide, they had a flight booked on January 1st to take them back to Indonesia, and then they were due to fly back to Germany on January 24th, 1992. Anya's father had gone to the Munich airport to pick the two up that day, but they never got off the plane. After checking with the airline and finding out that they had never boarded the flight, he talked to Gabor's parents and they all spent the next few days trying to contact them. By January 30th, with no success at finding their children, Gabor and Anya were reported missing to the Australian Federal Police by the German Embassy. Two months later, Gabor's parents flew to Sydney and they tried to find their son and his girlfriend. With no success, they rented a camper van and traveled all over the country checking backpacker hostels for any sign of the couple, but came up with nothing. 22-year-old Joanne Walters was another young adult who loved traveling. Raised in Maesteg, South Wales, she had already been to Greece, Italy, and Sardinia. Joanne flew to Sydney in June of 1991. After a short stay in Sydney, she traveled up to Queensland and did some temporary work before returning to Sydney. At a hostel in King's Cross, she met another solo backpacker, 22-year-old Carolyn Clark, who was from Surrey, England. Carolyn had been backpacking around Europe with another friend, but that friend went home in August, while Carolyn flew to Australia on her own. Once she met Joanne, the young women began traveling together. It's common for people who want to travel on a budget to stop and find temporary work along the way. This way they can spend a little money getting from one point to another, then stop and make a little money, then spend it going to their next destination. In February of 1992, Joanne, Caroline, and two other backpackers went to Mildura, west of Sydney and Victoria. They spent about six weeks picking grapes to make some money to continue their adventure. When they were done working, they went back to Sydney and then hitchhiked to Melbourne, where they took a ferry to Tasmania. After a few weeks in Tasmania, they traveled back to Sydney, where they stayed in an apartment for a couple of weeks. It seemed that by the end of April of 1992, Joanne and Caroline had decided to hitchhike back to Mildura, possibly to work, but it's unknown. They left Sydney and were never seen again. After not hearing from their daughter for over a month, Joanne's parents reported her missing to police in North Sydney. Not long after, Caroline was reported missing to the New South Wales Missing Persons Unit. According to Australia's National Missing Persons Coordination Center, more than 38,000 missing persons reports are received by police each year. Now, many of those people are found relatively quickly, but about 2,600 become long-term missing persons. Those are people who remain missing for more than three months. In 1992, the head of the New South Wales Missing Persons Unit, Sergeant Peter Marcone, reported that there were more than 861 people listed as long-term missing in New South Wales at the time. He said that there were another 400 cases being investigated as newly reported missing persons. The disappearances of Simone, Gabor, Anya, Joanne, and Caroline all got combined due to the fact that they were foreign visitors to the country. At the time, the disappearance of James and Deborah weren't connected to the others. The police investigated as much as they could, but never found any credible sightings of the missing backpackers. Carolyn's parents traveled to Sydney in August of 1992 and began trying to find their daughter. They scoured Sydney and even went to Mildura to the vineyard that the girls had worked at and talked to the owners, but they left without any clues. On September 19, 1992, a pair of friends on an orienteering exercise in the Belangelo State Forest stumbled across the remains of a human body. The Belangelo State Forest is about 140 kilometers or 85 miles southwest of Sydney, just off the Hume Highway. It's a forest about 3,800 hectare or 9,400 acres that was planted starting in 1919. It's free for the public to use and is a popular spot for camping, hiking, and four-wheeling. The men found the body under an overhang covered with sticks and leaves. When the police arrived, the body was badly decomposed, but the medical examiner was able to determine that the remains belonged to a female and they identified multiple signs of violence. 
There was evidence of 14 stab wounds to the neck, chest, and back, some of which cut ribs, the spine, and the cervical vertebrae. They found a garrote on the ground near the body. This is a weapon made up of wire or cord that's used to strangle someone. The next day, as police were searching the area for evidence, they found the remains of a second female. These remains were tucked beneath a fallen tree and covered with sticks and leaves about 30 meters from the first body. This body was also stabbed a number of times, but also shot 10 times in the head from all different angles. The front, back, each side, and even the top of the head. The head had been wrapped in a red cloth before being shot. 10 22 caliber shell casings were found on the ground near the body. These murders showed an extreme level of violence that made it apparent that the killer was a very angry and deranged person. The bodies were suspected of belonging to Joanne Walters, the first one found, and Caroline Clark, the second one found. Once the identities were confirmed, Joanne's parents, who were still in Sydney, were notified. Then a call was made to Caroline's parents, who were still in England. Investigators searched a wide area around the crime scene and along the Hume Highway, but no other evidence was found. The police offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to an arrest, even including the possibility of immunity to an accomplice if they hadn't been involved in the actual murders. By November of 1992, all the evidence had been analyzed and authorities had no leads. The case became cold. On October 5, 1993, two more bodies were discovered in the Belangelo Forest. A local man always thought there could be more victims in the area after Joanne and Caroline's bodies were found, so he would regularly hike around the trails and fire roads, looking for anything suspicious. On his walk this day, he happened to find human bones that showed signs of violence. When police arrived, they found skeletonized human remains at the base of a tree, partially covered with sticks and leaves. The bones had been disturbed by animals, but most of the bones from the upper body were still there and showed evidence of stabbing and a skull fracture. Women's clothes were scattered nearby. Investigators began searching the area and found a second set of remains at the base of a different tree. This one was curled up in the fetal position, still clothed with multiple stab wounds to the chest and back. They knew that they had one man and one female victim, but it took several days before the remains could be positively identified as James Gibson and Deborah Everest. An even wider area was examined around the area where the bodies were found, and about 400 meters away, nine bullets were recovered from a tree trunk. All but one were damaged beyond identification, but the last one was found to be a 22 caliber bullet, the same as the bullets recovered from Caroline's body. On October 16th, Detective Kevin Hammond went to the Belongolo Pistol Club and asked if anyone had seen anything suspicious. One of the members suggested that he talk to another member named Alex Malott. The detective spoke with Alex and they scheduled a time for him to come into the police station to be interviewed. Alex was the older brother of Ivan Malott. On October 18th, Alex arrived at the police station and told the detectives this story. On April 26, 1992, he and a friend, Bill Ayers, had left the pistol club and were driving on Belongolo Road toward Hume Highway. They were in Alex's vehicle, but Bill was driving. They passed two cars as they were driving away from the gun club. The first was a brown 1980s Ford Falcon, and it was signaling that it was going to turn into the forest. The second was a brown and beige four-wheel drive vehicle, either a Holden Rodeo or a Nissan Navara. As the Ford Falcon passed by, Alex noticed that the driver was white, tall, thin, in his mid-twenties with tattoos on the fingers of his left hand. He went on to say that the man had red hair in a flat top cut with mutton chop sideburns and a prominent nose and Adam's apple, quite detailed for a quick glimpse as the car passed by. Then he told the detectives that there was a male passenger who he described in equally specific detail and claimed that he was holding a 410 model shotgun. In the back seat was a Caucasian woman in her mid-twenties with mousy colored shoulder length hair. She had what appeared to be a gag in her mouth, and as they passed by, she sat up and looked at him. He said it seemed like she was trying to get his attention. As the four-wheel drive passed by, he saw two men in the front seat and a man and woman in the back seat. This woman was also Caucasian, in her mid-twenties, with dark brown hair. 
She also had a gag in her mouth, and he said her eyes widened as she saw him. He said she looked frightened. Alex said he didn't get a good look at the men in the front, but the man in the back seat was Caucasian with brown hair, neatly groomed. He was clean-shaven and looked to be well-dressed, wearing an off-white collar-style long-sleeve shirt. As they got closer, Alex explained that the man in the back seat put his hand up next to his face to shield it from view. Alex said that he noticed that his hands were clean and smooth, like he didn't do any outdoor labor. He said he also wrote down the license plate number of the second vehicle but had since lost it. The detective showed Alex pictures of the victims and he identified Caroline and Joanne as being the two women in the vehicles. He said he didn't end up reporting what he saw because he assumed that they were all just going into the woods to have a good time. He also said he had seen the same Ford Falcon before and inside he could see multiple rifles, at least two being 22 caliber and one being a Ruger. The detectives questioned Bill Ayers to see if his story matched Alex's. He said he did recall seeing a couple of cars that day, but didn't remember anything else. It was safe to say that the detectives didn't quite believe Alex. His story was impossibly detailed. He saw a prominent Adam's apple. He could tell the man had soft hands. They also found it hard to understand why he would think these people were just going out to the woods for a good time after seeing the women gagged and looking afraid. Around this time, authorities also got a tip from some men who worked at a nearby gypsum factory. They had grown concerned by comments one of their co-workers, Paul Miller, had said. In April of 1992, when the news was printing the story of Gabor and Anya's disappearance, Paul had told them that he knew who killed the Germans, but quickly changed the subject. When news announced the discovery of Joanne and Caroline's remains, Paul once again spoke up and said, There's more bodies out there. They haven't found them all yet. The men knew that their co-worker used the name Paul Miller at work, but that his real name was Richard Malott. He had told his co-workers that he came from a large family with a bunch of brothers, some of whom were violent. The company found out that Paul was using a fake name and tax information and he was let go at the end of 1992, but his comments continued to bother the co-workers. Police searched the name Paul Miller and found a criminal record along with a record of driving offenses for Richard Malott. The police were criticized for not finding a second set of remains in the Belonglo Forest when they searched it after the discovery of Joanne and Caroline's bodies. By the end of October, authorities were setting up a task force to search the forest again. This time, they had satellite images and formed precise search grids. They used GPS to track the locations of any significant items that were found. They had 300 officers from various regions being housed nearby and bussed to the forest to painstakingly search every bit of it. Two specially trained cadaver dogs searched part of the forest and they had to wear specially made boots because the terrain was so rough. On November 1st, the skeletal remains of a fifth body were discovered in the forest. The upper part of the body was sticking out from a pile of sticks and leaves that looked to be an attempt to hide the body. Clothing, jewelry, and backpacking equipment were found nearby, but no backpack. The medical examiner found multiple stab wounds to the chest and back, and investigators found a piece of wire tied into a noose near the body. This body was positively identified as Simone Schmiedel. Unfortunately, Simone's mother heard about the discovery of her body on the radio in Germany before the authorities had a chance to contact her. Three days later, on November 4th, a search team found another set of skeletal remains buried under forest debris. The remains showed signs of multiple stab wounds, one severing the spine, and the skull was missing. Near the remains was a blue and yellow rope with loops tied in each end. About 50 meters from these remains were another set of skeletal remains beside a log. The skull was still with this body, which had six bullet holes in it. Four of them were later confirmed to be 22 caliber rounds. There was also a cloth tied around the skull which looked to have been a gag. There was evidence that the body had also been stabbed. Near the body, authorities found a money bill containing international student cards belonging to Gabor Neugenbauer and Anya Habscheid. Inside the belt were five American Express traveler's checks and some cash. They also found a plastic bag with two airline tickets. 
About 200 meters from these remains, investigators found boxes from 22 caliber ammunition, some with partial batch numbers on them. They found 47 22 caliber Winchester shell casings and 46 22 caliber Ely shell casings. Six bullet fragments were found in a tree trunk nearby. When the identities were confirmed to be Gabor and Anya, their parents were notified in Germany. Authorities continued searching the Belonglo forest for another 12 days before ending their search. Investigators then began processing hundreds of pieces of evidence. Clothing, pieces of tape that were suspected as being used as restraints, fingerprints, bullet casings, and the ammo packaging. After all seven bodies were located, the government increased the reward for information leading to an arrest to $500,000, the largest reward ever offered in Australia at the time. The investigators determined that many of the bullet casings found in the area near Gabor's body, as well as casings near Caroline's body, came from the same 22 caliber Ruger 10-22 semi-automatic rifle fitted with a silencer. They also found that the firing pin left an upward indentation which came from a manufacturing defect in Ruger's made between 1964 and 1982. Authorities were able to get information about all of the Ruger rifles of that type that had been imported into Australia. Then they began the painstaking process of tracking where every rifle ended up. On November 9th, a woman called the tip hotline and told them that in January of 1990, she had been driving on the Hume Highway when she saw a man running down the road being chased by another man. When she stopped near the first man, he yelled, Help me, he's got a gun! She led him in her car and drove him to the nearest police station. The man's name was Paul Onions. Two days later, Paul called the tip line himself. Paul Onions was from England and he told authorities that he had flown to Sydney in December of 1989. In January, he set out to hitchhike to Melbourne and was quickly picked up by a man who said his name was Bill, driving a white or silver Toyota or Nissan four-wheel drive utility vehicle. He said the man was in his 40s with black hair and a horseshoe mustache. Paul said that they drove for about an hour before the man pulled over and pulled out a gun. He said he ran and the man chased him. He said the man started shooting wildly at him, so he was running in a zigzag until he reached the road where he was picked up and taken to the police station. Paul left his backpack with all of his belongings, including his passport, in the vehicle when he ran. When the current task force looked into Paul's original police report, they found a hard copy of the report, but no follow-up was done. When information was gathered about the entire Malott family, Ivan's criminal background came up and police began to narrow their focus to him. Reports from the rape trial back in 1974 listed one of the abducted women as saying that she had asked Ivan if he had done this before, and he responded yes and said he often picked up hitchhikers and he always carried knives and ropes in case an opportunity arose. By the start of 1994, Ivan Malat was a strong suspect and on February 26th, he was put under surveillance. Investigators looked into the vehicles that Ivan had owned and found that he owned a silver Nissan four-wheel drive utility vehicle, just like the one described by Paul. On May 2nd, Paul Onions arrived in Sydney and spent the day with detectives, taking them to the spots where he had been picked up and then to where the attempted abduction happened. Then he was taken to the police station where he was shown a photo array. He picked out Ivan as the man who had picked him up and tried to abduct him in 1990. It was important to note that Paul had been picked up not long after setting off on his hitchhiking journey from Liverpool, an area southwest of Sydney. All seven victims recovered from the Belongolo Forest had been picked up while hitchhiking from Liverpool. This gave the investigators a smoking gun that allowed them to get warrants for seven properties owned by various members of the Malat family. The task force spent two weeks preparing for a massive raid on the Malat family where they would arrest Ivan for the attempted abduction of Paul Onions and then search the properties for evidence that linked him to the backpacker murders. The day before the raid was set to happen, detectives went to Alex Malat's house to see if they could get any more details out of him. The interview went nowhere until one of the investigators asked Alex if he had any ammunition, and the man showed them a large quantity of Winchester 22 caliber rounds, the same type that had been found at the crime scenes. Then they asked if they owned any backpacks, and Alex's wife, Joan, said yeah, there was one outside in the shed. 
Alex led them outside to a shed, where Joan pulled out a backpack, which investigators immediately knew was Simone's. When asked where she had gotten it, Joan had explained that Ivan had given it to her. He said one of his friends was moving and didn't need it anymore. Detectives left Alex's house with a DNA sample from Alex and Simone's backpack. On May 22, 1994, police teams surrounded Ivan's house and a negotiator called him on the phone. When he answered, he denied being Ivan, though the police knew that he and his girlfriend were the only two inside the house. The negotiator told him to come out of the house with his arms up and follow the police instructions. Ivan said that he had to put his pants on and hung up. After a few minutes, nobody exited the house, so the negotiator called again. This time, Ivan's girlfriend, Shalander Hughes, answered the phone. She had no idea what Ivan had done or that the police had surrounded the house. She put Ivan back on the phone and he claimed that he thought the first call was his workmates playing a joke on him. He agreed to come out and hung up the phone, but again, nobody exited the house. The negotiator made a third call where Shalander answered again and said they were about to come out. A few minutes later, Ivan walked out of the front door and into police custody. Challender was quickly taken from the home to a local police station where she was questioned, but police already knew that she was not involved in any crimes. When Ivan was told he was being arrested for the attempted abduction of Paul Onions, he played dumb. He did the same thing when he was told he was being investigated in regards to the backpacker murders. The first piece of evidence the team found was a postcard that was addressed to Bill, the same name Ivan used when he picked up Paul. It was dated April 22, 1992, four days after Joanne and Caroline disappeared. In Ivan's bedroom, they found 38 Winchester 22 caliber rounds. They found some Indonesian currency, though Ivan had never been to Indonesia, but Gabor and Anya had just come from Indonesia when they disappeared. They found two rolls of black electrical tape that matched the tape found near Gabor and Anya's bodies. They also found a driver's license with Ivan's picture on it in the name of Michael Malott. In another bedroom, they found a camouflage knife that matched the description given by Paul. They found four boxes of Ely 22 caliber ammunition that had the same batch number as the boxes found in the forest, apart from a Ruger rifle and the instruction manual to a Ruger 1022. They also found a green water bottle that matched the description of one that Simone was traveling with. In Ivan's sister's room, they found a green sleeping bag that matched the description of one that Deborah had owned, and another sleeping bag that matched the description of Simone's. A camera, a cooking set, a camp stove, and cups that all matched the descriptions of the same items owned by Simone were found in the kitchen. In the rest of the house, they found a tent and a sleeping bag cover that were believed to have belonged to Simone. They found a silencer that fit a 22 caliber rifle more black electrical tape, and zip ties that matched the ones found by Gabor and Anya's bodies. They also found a piece of cord that had blood on it. Hidden in a wall, they found a bag that contained a breech bolt assembly, a trigger assembly, and a Ramlite magazine from a Ruger 1022. A ballistics expert identified a crescent-shaped firing pin and two small burrs on the bolt face that matched impressions on many of the shell casings collected from the forest. Test firing proved that those gun parts had been used in the rifle that killed Caroline. At Ivan's mother's house, they found another 22 caliber rifle along with clothing that matched the description of clothing owned by Simone and Paul Onions. At Richard Malott's house, they found a tent, a sleeping bag, and a bedroll that matched the descriptions of ones owned by Caroline along with a blue sleeping bag that matched the description of Joanne's. Richard told investigators that Ivan had him and another family member come pick up a bunch of guns and ammo from his house in March of 1994. He said it was because the police might come to investigate him. Ivan was taken to the police station and interviewed for hours, but he continued to deny everything. When his lawyer arrived, detectives told him that Ivan was being charged with the armed robbery of Paul Onions, but they would need to analyze all of the evidence collected in the raid before they announced any more charges. As far as Clive Small, lead of the task force, was concerned, Ivan was fucked. Not only had he been identified by a victim that got away, but he had all of the victim's belongings at his or other family members' homes. They found a backpack that was an exact match for the one Simone had at Alex's house. Is it likely that someone else owned that exact same backpack? 
it's not just likely, it's perfectly reasonable. Is it likely that that backpack, along with a tent and sleeping bag that matched the ones owned by Caroline, ended up in the possession of the Malots? I wouldn't say likely, but I wouldn't base a trial on it. Is it likely that items that matched Simone's backpack, sleeping bag, camera, clothing, and all of her other camping gear, Caroline's tent, bedroll, and sleeping bag, Deborah's sleeping bag, Indonesian money, and Paul's clothes all ended up with the Malats? No, not even a little bit. Then you add the electrical tape, the zip ties, the ammunition from the same batch, the matching bullets, Oh, and the DNA from the blood on that cord found in Ivan's house came back as being from a child of Caroline Clark's parents. Ivan was fucked. On October 24, 1994, Ivan Malat was officially charged with seven counts of murder, one count of attempted murder, one count of robbery, and one count of false imprisonment. Ivan's defense strategy was to deny everything. He claimed that he hadn't owned any guns, though his ex-wife testified that he always had a gun on him, and investigators found a rifle that had Ivan's name etched into it. He claimed that all of the items that matched the possessions of the backpackers that were in his or his family's homes was just a big coincidence. Yeah, a huge coincidence. Some of the items were German brands that weren't common in Australia. He also tried to claim that one of his brothers was the real murderer and that they had planted all of the backpacker belongings at his house. Something he would say in a later interview wasn't true. Further investigations showed that the other Malat boys didn't have the same connections to the crimes that Ivan did. It was believed that Alex knew that Ivan had committed the murders and tried to protect him by making up a story when he was interviewed the first time. Members of the Malat family brought in a photo album with pictures of family events that would give Ivan an alibi for one of the murders, but it turned out that the date on the picture had been changed. When Paul Onions testified about his attempted abduction and identified Ivan, saying he had a horseshoe mustache at the time, Ivan denied ever having a mustache like that. Then the district attorney showed a picture of Ivan with the exact same mustache from that time frame. Even Ivan's own attorney admitted that Ivan was lying. After three days of deliberation, on July 27, 1996, Ivan Malat was found guilty on all charges. He was given seven life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 18 years for the other three charges. In 1997, Ivan and another inmate came up with an ill-fated plan to overwhelm the guards and escape from the prison. They were quickly arrested after they made their first move. In 2001, Ivan swallowed razor blades, staples, and a small metal chain from a pair of nail clippers. He must have been treated successfully as there aren't any more details about the incident. In 2009, Ivan cut off his little finger with a plastic knife and attempted to mail it to a New South Wales Supreme Court justice, but it never made it there. Ivan was taken to the hospital, but they weren't able to reattach the finger. In 2011, he went on a nine-day hunger strike when his request for a PlayStation was denied. Ivan Milot was diagnosed with terminal esophageal cancer in May of 2019 and died on October 27th of the same year. In 2010, Ivan's great-nephew, Matthew Milot, killed a 17-year-old in the Belongolo State Forest with an axe while his friend Cohen Klein recorded the audio on his phone. He was sentenced to 43 years in prison in 2012. It seems that being a monster runs in the family. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. 
You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again, and be safe.